we need to talk about race. Why are people protesting? Why are people angry? Slavery ended 150 years ago. The civil rights movement was 60 years ago. Racial discrimination is illegal now. Heck, we even had a black president. So why are people still upset? We're going to go through history and we're going to look at some data and we're going to go quickly so this video doesn't get too long. So hang on. These are two households in America. One is black, the other is white. Today, the average black household has 60% of the income of the average white household, but only one-tenth of the household wealth. Why does that matter? Well, household wealth helps send kids to school, helps launch small businesses, stabilizes loss of income, and helps families survive catastrophic events like divorce or unemployment. What's amazing about this number is that there are lots of extremely wealthy African Americans. Movie stars, pop stars, 75% of the NBA, 70% of the NFL, Oprah, Tyler Perry, Ben Carson, Morgan Freeman. And there are a lot of extremely poor white families. Think of Appalachia and other parts of rural America. But even when we factor all that in, the average black household still has only one-tenth the wealth of the average white household. How did that happen? Well, here we go. What happened after we freed the slaves, after the Civil War ended? Nine states enacted vagrancy laws, making it a crime to not have a job. The law was applied only to black men. Eight of those states then allowed prisoners, the black men who'd just been arrested for not having a job, to be hired out to plantation owners with little or no pay going to the prisoners themselves. So, that's right, men who had been freed from the plantations found themselves right back on the plantations. Additional laws prohibited mischief and insulting gestures, which allowed more black men to be arrested and created a huge market for convict leasing. Working conditions for these leased convicts could be worse than slavery because the plantation owner leasing the black prisoner had no long-term interest in his well-being. By the turn of the 20th century, every state in the South had mandated racial segregation by law, Jim Crow laws, which supported a social ostracism for blacks that extended to schools, churches, housing, jobs, restrooms, hotels and restaurants, hospitals, prisons, funeral homes, morgues, and cemeteries. White politicians competed with each other to be more strict and specific on segregation. For example, a law prohibiting blacks and whites from playing chess together. No interracial chess playing! That might lead to lawn darts. In 1896, the Supreme Court ruled that these Jim Crow laws were perfectly legal because they, quote, reflected customs and traditions and, quote, preserved public peace and good order. These laws stayed in place until 1954, when the idea of separate but equal was struck down in the ruling known as Brown versus Board of Education. So what happened next after Brown? Well, in 1956, the Southern Manifesto was signed by 101 out of 128 Congress members from the South, pledging to maintain Jim Crow by all means possible. Five states passed nearly 50 new Jim Crow laws after 1954. Private whites-only schools, dubbed segregation academies, popped up all across the South, many of them Christian. But now widespread civil rights protests, combined with anti-war protests that were occasionally becoming violent, inspired the political rise of law and order rhetoric. Richard Nixon became the first candidate to campaign specifically on a platform of law and order. In 1968, 81% of Americans agreed that law and order had broken down in this country, and the majority blamed communists and Negroes who start riots. Let's go back to household wealth. The average black household has one-tenth the wealth of the average white household. Why is that? Because the number one source of intergenerational wealth in America is home ownership. And from the 1930s to well into the 1960s, the federal government enacted policies to actively encourage white families to own homes and discourage black families from doing the same. In 1934, the Federal Housing Administration created a risk rating system to determine which neighborhoods were safe investment for federally backed mortgages. Black neighborhoods were deemed too risky, marked off in maps with red ink, in a practice now known as redlining. After World War II, a boom of new suburban housing was built all over the country, much of it restricted by deed to whites only. 
In 1948, 40% of new housing developments in Minneapolis, for example, had covenants prohibiting purchase by African Americans. So blacks couldn't live in white neighborhoods and couldn't get federally insured loans for black neighborhoods. Until 1950, the Realtor's Code of Ethics specifically prohibited selling a house in a white neighborhood to a non-white family. You could lose your Realtor's license if you helped a black family buy a home in a white neighborhood. In the 1930s, the FHA's underwriting manual said, quote, incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. The FHA went on to recommend that highways would be a great way to separate black neighborhoods from white neighborhoods. The FHA funded huge white-only suburban housing developments, leaving blacks behind in inner cities. After World War II, the GI Bill provided subsidized mortgages to help millions of men returning from war to buy their first home. While technically eligible for the GI Bill, the way it was administered left one million black veterans largely on the outside looking in. In New York and New Jersey, the GI Bill insured more than 67,000 new mortgages. Fewer than 100 of those went for homes purchased by non-whites. In 1947, there were 3,200 mortgages in Mississippi guaranteed by the government for returning veterans. Of the 3,200, only two went to black veterans. As a result, white families after the war were able to build home equity, growing wealth for retirement, inheritance, and college education for their kids. One historian has stated that there was no greater instrument for widening an already huge racial gap in post-war America than the GI Bill. And then came the war on drugs. Inner-city blacks were extremely vulnerable economically. The overwhelming majority of African Americans in 1970 lacked college degrees and had grown up in fully segregated schools. In the second half of the 20th century, factories and manufacturing jobs moved to the suburbs. Black workers struggled to follow the jobs. They couldn't live in many of the new suburban developments. And as late as 1970, only 28% of black fathers had access to a car. When a white man in Cicero, Illinois, just outside Chicago, sublet an apartment to a black family, the white community rioted, setting fire to the apartment building and smashing windows until the National Guard had to intervene. The result of all of this. In 1970, 70% of African American men had good blue-collar jobs. By 1987, only 28% did. As unemployment skyrocketed in African-American communities, so did drug use. As drug use increased, so did crime. A dynamic today that we see playing out in white rural communities hit hard by unemployment and opioid addiction. Throughout the 1970s, white America became increasingly concerned by images of black violence shown on TV and in magazines. Drugs were the problem. Drug dealers and drug users were the enemy. So we decided to treat the drug epidemic not as a health crisis, but as a crisis of criminality, and we militarized our response. During the Reagan-Bush years from 1981 to 1991, how we invested money in anti-drug allocation completely changed. The anti-drug budget for the Department of Defense went from $33 million in 1981 to more than $1 billion in 1991. The Drug Enforcement Agency's budget to fight criminality and drug use went from $86 million to more than $1 billion. Then we came to the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act which carried mandatory minimum sentences, much harsher for the distribution of crack cocaine, which was associated with blacks, than powder cocaine, which was associated with whites. Mandated evictions from public housing for any tenant who permitted drug-related criminal activity to occur on or near premises. It eliminated many government benefits, including student loans, for anyone convicted of a drug crime. The 1988 revision set a five-year minimum sentence for possessing any amount of crack cocaine, even if there was no intent to distribute. Previously, it had been a one-year maximum sentence for possessing any amount of any drug without the intent to distribute. Now, it might seem like we're picking on Republicans, so now it's time to pick on some Democrats. During the Clinton presidency, the funding for public housing was cut by $17 billion. At the same time, the funding for prisons increased by $19 billion. $19 
the number of Americans imprisoned for drug crimes exploded. In 1980, there were 41,000 Americans imprisoned for drug crimes. Today, there are more than a half million, more than the entire 1980 prison population. Most arrests are for possession. In 2005, 80% of the arrests were for possessing drugs, not selling drugs. In a bizarre twist, we also militarized our police forces. Between 1997 and 1999, the Pentagon handled 3.4 million orders for military equipment from more than 11,000 police agencies, including 253 aircraft, including Black Hawk and Huey helicopters, 7,800 M16 rifles, 181 grenade launchers, grenade launchers for the police, 8,000 bulletproof helmets, 1,200 night vision goggles. We also changed policing tactics. A no-knock entry is when a SWAT team literally breaks down your door or smashes in through the windows, like in E.T. when the cops come flying in from every direction looking for E.T. So back to Minneapolis. In 1986, Minneapolis SWAT teams performed no-knock entries 35 times. Ten years later, in 1996, they performed no-knock entries 700 times. That's two every day. There were financial incentives for arresting more drug users. Federal grants to local police departments were tied to the number of drug arrests. Research suggests the huge surge in arrests from increased drug enforcement was due more to budget incentives than to actual increases in drug use. So what was the result? An explosion of our prison population. In 25 years, the U.S. prison population went from 350,000 to over 2.3 million. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We imprison a higher percentage of our black population than South Africa ever did during apartheid. Data shows that the increased prison population was driven primarily by changes in sentencing policy. There was no visible connection between higher incarceration rates and higher violent crime rates. If you are a drug felon, you are barred from public housing. You are ineligible for food stamps. You're forced to check the box on employment applications marking yourself as a convicted felon. A criminal record has been shown to reduce the likelihood of getting a callback or job offer by as much as 50%. The negative impact of a criminal record for an African-American job applicant is twice as large as for a white applicant. In 2006, one in 106 white men was behind bars. For black men, it was one in 14. For black men between the age of 20 and 35, the age where families are built, it's one in nine. Overall, African Americans and white Americans use drugs at roughly the same rate. But the imprisonment rate of African Americans for drug charges is almost six times that of whites. It may be true that there isn't explicit racism in our legal system anymore, but it doesn't mean justice is blind. A study, a law in Georgia, permitted prosecutors to seek life imprisonment for a second drug offense. Over the period of the study, this law was used against 1% of white second-time offenders and 16% of black second-time offenders. As a result, 98% of prisoners serving life sentences under this law were black. Study, African-American youth in the U.S. make up 16% of all youth but 28% of all juvenile arrests, 35% of youth sent to adult court instead of juvenile court, and 58% of youth admitted to adult state prison. A study, blacks on the New Jersey Turnpike make up 15% of all drivers, but 42% of all stops by police and 73% of all arrests. Among all drivers stopped, white drivers were two times more likely than black drivers to be carrying drugs. Study, Volusia County, Florida, 5% of drivers were black or Latino, but 80% of drivers stopped were black or Latino. Study, Oakland, California. Black drivers are twice as likely as white drivers to be stopped and three times more likely to be searched. In Minneapolis, Philando Castile had been pulled over 49 times in 13 years, mostly for minor infractions. The 49th time he was pulled over, he was shot by the officer while sitting inside his car. He'd been pulled over for a broken taillight.
Chuck Colson's organization, Prison Fellowship, recently organized a manifesto that was signed by evangelical leaders asserting that our over-reliance on incarceration fails to make us safer or restore the people and communities who have been harmed. Unconscious bias seeps into schools, too, as white teachers often assume black students are less intelligent than they actually are. A gifted student usually has to be recommended by a teacher to move to a gifted track. When a teacher is black, an equally gifted white and black student have comparable chances of being recommended. When the teacher is white, the black student's odds of being recommended are cut in half. Are white teachers racist? No. Are they affected by bias? Yes. And it affects black students every day. So where are we? The average black household has one-tenth the wealth of the average white household. This didn't happen by accident. It happened by policy. We, the majority culture, told them where they could live and where they couldn't. Then we moved most of the jobs to the places we told them they couldn't live. When the predictable explosion of unemployment and poverty resulted in a predictable increase in drug use and crime, we criminalized the problem. We built $19 billion of new jails and sold grenade launchers to the police. As a result, a white boy born in America today has a 1 in 23 chance of going to prison in his lifetime. For a black boy, it's 1 in 4. And that is why people are angry. Many people care deeply about these issues. Many have suggested solutions. Some of those have been tested, with results ranging from moderate success to abject failure. I'm not here to tell you what the right solutions are, because I don't know. I'm just here to ask you to do one thing. It is the thing that begins every journey to a solution for every problem. What am I asking you to do? Care.